please join me in welcoming Gus Smith back home to South Carolina. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm honored with this opportunity. Uh, all those groups that uh, Brad mentioned that I've been with did better after I left them. <laughs> um, this is a great group, and I want to thank all of you for what you've done for Upstate Forever, which has done such amazing things in this 10-county uh, area. I'm more familiar with the Coastal Conservation League down in the other part of the state, but between these two groups, uh, amazing things have, uh, have been accomplished. Uh, and Cameron and I are sorry about the snow that we brought from Vermont. Uh, the, um, I want to join in congratulating the awardees. Uh, what a wonderful group of people. Uh, and, uh, and I mainly want to congratulate Brad. It's been almost two decades uh, since he founded this amazing group and, uh, and has led it and, and given it strength and direction and uh, proud to have him as a friend and colleague and proud also that he graduated from my school at Yale. Uh, and Greenville, oh my gosh, I hadn't been here in decades and something happened. Uh, uh, got kind of pretty. Uh, I, uh, uh, somebody got hope and maybe this has happened to write up this story because there are a lot of places that have been depressed. Uh, economically and socially, and uh, we need uh, these beacons for we're making a turnaround. And so I hope the Greenville story is being written up in a way that can inspire other cities, including our church. Uh, uh, my text uh, for today uh, is uh, from uh, the Reverend Brad Weish, uh, and uh, he wrote, uh, I'll paraphrase a little bit here, but not the key part. Uh, it says, I have watched environmental developments, quote, with a mixture of pride and dread. Uh, and I think that's a good starting point for my talk. Uh, you know, we, we all shudder to think uh, what South Carolina would be like uh, without these two great groups from in the state and, and others. Um, we shudder to think what our country would be like without the big environmental organizations like the Natural Resources Defense Council and, and others. Uh, they are doing great things uh, every day, and we, we should be proud, as Brad says. Uh, and I'm proud of my role in NRDC and, and other groups, and the source of great satisfaction to me. Uh, but we've also got to face the dread part, and that is the great paradox of American environmentalism. Uh, and it is that 45 years since the first Earth Day when our one-year-old daughter was roaming around the Washington Mall, uh, you know, and, and our groups are, are uh, have become in that period so much stronger and more sophisticated and larger and better funded and more members, and we've won so many battles along the way, and, and yet, yet, we find ourselves today on the cusp of losing the planet. We won lots of battles, but the planet is facing really, uh, and I don't exaggerate, a ruin. Uh, as we as we dine here uh, today, and that's the real cause uh, for for dread. I'm I'm going to not belabor, but hopefully remind people of some of the serious issues that that we do face. Um, the climate issue is the most serious, I think. Uh, it's coming at us. It's a tsunami uh, right offshore, and uh, it promises tremendous destruction, hardship, biological loss, uh, human loss, agricultural declines, and other things. And we, we knew about it back when I was in the Carter administration. We put out four reports calling for action, the latest one in January 1981. So we knew a long time ago what we needed to do, uh, and we didn't do it, and now we're going to suffer uh, before we bring this problem under control. We don't have to suffer the worst consequences, but we, we will 
have consequences. Uh, biodiversity loss globally is extreme. Forest loss remains serious. Fisheries decline. Freshwater problems all around, including emerging in our part of the world. Um, agricultural soils uh, threatened, uh, toxic chemicals. But really, what I really want to remind people of is not these global scale threats, which I think people appreciate are largely out of control, but just how far we still have to go domestically in areas where we actually put tough laws in place uh, uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, in 1972, we declared that all the waters of the U.S. should be fishable as well. Well, still today, from a third to a half of the freshwater bodies in our country don't meet the visual and swimmable uh, standard. A third of Americans still suffer uh, from unhealthy air that fails uh, to meet EPA standards. We have protected an area the size of California in designated wilderness, uh, but during that uh, same time, say over the last three decades, uh, we've paved or built on or otherwise developed uh, an acreage of land equivalent to New York State in our country. And I know you have uh, loss of open space in this region. It's a very serious problem. What is it, 35 acres a day? Something like that, a day. Uh, over a third of the aquatic species in, in our country are, are threatened with extinction. Uh, from 15 to 20 percent of the birds and mammals and reptiles uh, and that's, those are numbers of sort of pre-climate change uh, numbers. Uh, since Earth Day 1970, we've increased the paved roads by over 50 percent, the vehicle miles traveled by over 200 percent, the solid waste per capita uh, by a third, um, and of course we are dumping um, several billion pounds of toxic waste uh, each year uh, into the environment according to the federal uh, toxics release inventory. About 40% of that is released into uh, air and water uh, nearby. And our climate record is simply the greatest air election of civic responsibility in the history of the Republic. So we, we have a problem. We have a problem. Um, and um, despite all the efforts that have been made and all the progress and all the strengthening uh, the mighty forces of environmental destruction still rule today. Um, so we've grown and grown and we're winning many battles, but as I say, we're losing uh, the planet. And um, something is terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, and one thing we can conclude for sure from this story uh, is that more of the same is not going to do the job. We can keep, we have to continue to get stronger. Uh, the little NRDC that we started in 1970 now has a budget of over $100 billion a year. Uh, and other groups have grown in a comparable way. Uh, so what I have concluded and will share with you today is that we need a new environmentalism. The old environmentalism is good as far as it got us. Uh, and we need to continue doing the things that we have been doing and doing them better and on a larger scale. But we've also got to do some different things. Um, and, and in 45 years after that first Earth Day in 1970, it's time to reassess and reboot uh, American environmentalism. It came to me very strongly when I was working with one of the major environmental groups and they were doing a strategic plan and they made a list of the issues that they, you know, that, that, that would be the outline of the plan. And I looked at it, and it was the same list that we had created, almost the same list that we created in, in, in 1970. Uh, air pollution, water pollution, climate change was, was new. Um, and so I think the place to begin this search for a new environmentalism uh, is to ask ourselves the basic question. What, what's an environmental issue? What is an environmental issue? And the traditional list is that that I was just reeling off with air and water pollution and, and uh, open space and biodiversity. And yes, those are environmental issues, for sure. But what if we give a different answer uh, to this question of what is an environmental issue? 
and, and say that an environmental issue, and this will sound, I hope, plausible and reasonable to all of you, that an environmental issue is whatever determines environmental outcomes, whatever affects powerfully our ability to sustain and protect the environment for our children and grandchildren. If it does that, negatively, positively, it's an environmental issue, it's an environmental concern. And the moment that we reframe the issue in that way, something important happens, I think. We begin to see that the health of our politics is a dominating environmental issue. It is not something for other groups to work on. This ascendancy of money power over people power and, and all the flaws in the way our democracy is not working today, that's a huge environmental issue. This is a major determinant of environmental outcomes. Just look at Washington uh, today, and, and you have the result uh, apparent. So our, this, we need uh, to promote, as part of the environmental agenda, a long series of pro-democracy reforms in our country to save our failing democracy uh, before it's too late. Another issue that's not typically on the environmental agenda but has a huge effect on environmental outcomes uh, is vast economic and social insecurity in our country. All Mitch McConnell had to do to rally support against Obama's modest climate regulations is to say that it's going to hurt the economy, it's going to slow uh, job growth, uh, it's going to raise prices, and all of a sudden, huge swaths of the country uh, are, are, are scared. And, and we have a situation in the country now where poverty is at all time high, uh, where the bottom is falling out of the middle class, uh, half the families live paycheck to paycheck, about 40% of the families are low income, making less than twice the poverty level. And, uh, and we're creating uh, poor jobs in much of the country, not good ones. And raises, wages haven't substantially increased in decades, real wage rates. So people are scared. And, and the scared people are not going to rally behind the difficult measures that we now need to take on climate and, and other issues. So this social insecurity in the country is an environmental issue. And then there's us, right? There's our us and our uh, shop till you drop, our consumerism, our affluenza. Uh, we are carriers of bad values. And yet, in the mainline environmental groups, don't challenge us to a different lifestyle. Don't challenge us to en um, enough, not always more. And uh, don't challenge our values, our anthropocentrism, our contempocentrism, our materialism. And these are things that we've got to take on uh, and change if we hope to deal successfully with the environment. Another thing that uh, is apparently central to the to the problem of uh, in the sustained environmental loss is this uh, growth fetish that we have, the GDP worship, uh, indiscriminate growth, ruthless growth, rapacious growth. It doesn't matter, we just got to grow. And uh, it doesn't matter that it really doesn't work very well if it's the mindless kind of expansionism that we so often hear our politicians uh, talk about, but the real the core of the problem is GDP, the measurement of this, this, uh, this growth. Uh, I think it should be talk, called grossly distorted picture, uh, because as you know, it just lumps all the bad things that are going on and all the good things and all the neutral things together, and, um, and it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't generate on the scale that we need them, the kinds of jobs that we need. We're, GDP is back up above where it was before the recession in 2008, well above. We've had tremendous growth in GDP uh, since, say, 1980. The economy, I think, is, is going up about 150% in, in real terms. Uh, 
and uh, wages didn't increase. Uh, inequality went to all the levels that we haven't seen since the 20s. Unemployment, uh, you know, it had uh, uh, lowest social uh, mobility among the 20 advanced democracies. And I could go on, but this growth just doesn't deliver uh, as, as we think of it as GDP growth. So, you know, we need to grow in many areas. Lord knows there are things that need to grow in our country, a lot of them. But uh, by focusing only on aggregate GDP growth, as one of our leading presidential candidates did just the other day, and called for 4% growth in America forever. Uh, huge environmental decline projected there. Um, and I think we also need to begin to think about uh, how do we govern the corporate sector more effectively. Uh, there are a lot of ideas uh, for doing this, uh, taking corporate chartering more seriously uh, and other things. But one of the most interesting ideas is, is sort of building a different type of corporate sector from, from the ground up. Now uh, here I'm talking about uh, 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 B corporations, if you know about the B corporations, the, uh, the uh, social enterprises, public-private hybrids, profit-not-for-profit hybrids, uh, co-ops, uh, community development corporations, and a host of other things that uh, can help uh, build uh, a corporate sector that is deeply rooted in the community, deeply loyal to the community, uh, not footloose, very environmentally uh, friendly. So I, in sum, and really to conclude, uh, I think there, there are two big paths of fault with Washington in such shambles. Um, one is uh, political reform. Uh, this ought to be something that people across the whole spectrum of national life uh, should can come together on. Uh, you know, uh, putting in place uh, publicly financed elections like a number of states have done uh, to get and, and other doing other things to break the power of big money in our politics. Having an ethical proposition adopted at all legislative levels that says that um, if you are on a committee uh, regulating uh, a particular industry, uh, say the banking industry, uh, you cannot take any contributions from that industry. I mean, that is the nub of the corruption of our politics. And there's no reason we can't all get together and say that's enough. Uh, we shouldn't be doing that. That's a form of, of corruption. Um, and, you know, we could have uh, nonpartisan determination of, uh, of, of congressional districts, securing the right to vote for all Americans, making it easier to vote, longer longer voting periods, um, and other things. Uh, you know, this is pretty basic to making our democracy work, and there are many other political reforms that we could work on. Um, there's a way to elect the President of the United States by majority vote uh, without changing the Constitution. We just have to get enough states to agree that we're going to cast their full electoral college vote for the winner of the national popular election. And we already have enough states doing that to get us more than halfway there, including California. So I won't, you know, there's just a lot that we need to do to save our democracy from the situation we're sliding into today. Uh, and that is an environmental issue. The second big thing we can do there are signs of all around us in this uh, region of the state and in, around, uh, around our country. And, and that is to bring the future into the present in our communities, uh, to, to make uh, a living example out of our communities of the world that we'd like to see, the world that we'd like to leave to our children and our grandchildren. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the idea of more rooted enterprises. Uh, locally owned and focused, beholden to the community because people live in the community. Uh, small business and, uh, and startup incubators that give a flourishing of local enterprise uh, a chance to get off the ground. Uh, credit unions and local banking, uh, other things. Um, 
follow the food. Uh, this is the greatest thing in a way that's happening in our country is the uh, uh, is consumer supported agriculture, uh, farm to plate, uh, food hubs, uh, access uh, of the poor to, to really healthy uh, food uh, in their communities. Uh, lots of things going on, as you know well, uh, to make uh, the food supply more local, uh, richer, more healthy, uh, more organic. Um, follow the food. A mixed and, mixed and subsidized housing. So many of our communities uh, need uh, to have their housing issues addressed in a better way. Build a sharing community, one that specializes and, and uh, explores hundreds of ways in which people and neighbors and enterprises can share things rather than each own separately uh, something uh, that sits in the garage 90% uh, of the time. Uh, beyond consumerism, uh, figure ways that uh, other ways beyond sharing that we can move uh, beyond consumerism. Think of consumerism as a social disease. Not consumption, we all need to consume. Uh, but consumerism being the effort to meet our non-material needs uh, with more material things. And it just doesn't work. Advertisers know this and they keep us going. Uh, and uh, develop um, metrics that measure community progress beyond just monetary measures and beyond aggregations of, of like uh, you know, income production and GDP on the local scale. There are lots of new metrics that have, can be developed to measure the real health of the community. Uh, and, the, and measure the things we really do want to see improvement on and, and to grow. Things that don't happen just from, just from uh, growth. GDP off the pedestal, children, families on the pedestal. Local currencies uh, try to keep investments uh, in our communities to develop local economies. There are several places that I know of that are using local currencies. Um, decentralized uh, renewable energy, uh, clean energy, uh, committing our cities and regions to carbon neutrality, uh, new parks, even more parks, you've got some great ones here uh, in Greenville, but the protection of, of our waters and our natural areas and our areas of high ecological richness. Um, Control of sprawl, uh, tough but, but socially just uh, zoning and other, other controls. Public transportation, maybe bus rapid transport, which is being used in several cities. Um, urban city-based minimum wages and food shelves and other measures to help the disadvantaged and low wage among us. Green belts around, around our cities, and a greenway all the way to the mountains. Thank you very much.